Great. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Savage. I am uh, owner broker with Savage Real Estate here in Columbus. Um, I'm also the uh, chairman of the uh, Continuing Education Committee, a uh, commercial Continuing Education Committee. And um, I want to welcome everybody here uh, this afternoon. Um, there's a few house things that I need to go over with you. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to take too much long or too much time because I know you're here for Mr. Steiner. Um, so basically, um, this is Insight to 2050, Building Central Ohio's Toolkit. Um, for those of you who haven't been here, there are restrooms. Uh, kind of turn right and go toward the end of the hall. Um, please turn cell phones off, uh, computers, everything. Um, we, we appreciate that. There, did everybody get one of these forms? If you didn't, um, you can get one after the class. Please fill it out. Um, as head of the um, Education Committee, we, we value your feedback, and we also look for any information in, uh, that you want to supply to us about future classes. So uh, it's very, very important uh, that you do that. Um, and then also, um, Karen will have your uh, CE certificate after the class as well, so make sure you check out with her after the fact. Um, great. Leave it at that. Great. Um, all right. Well, we had a little technical difficulties. It's, it's warming up, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right, perfect. Um, so, uh, Mr. Steiner actually has a pretty impressive resume. resume. Um, he has a master's in both civil engineering and business, as well as a doctorate from the University of Toulouse uh, in France. And um, uh, in 1993, uh, he had a vision of creating welcoming, sustainable, uh, pedestrian friendly, mixed use town centers, as we all know at Easton. And, um, and an environment that's uh, people friendly. Um, over the past 18 years, the company has turned that vision into reality by developing more than 7.4 million square feet of mixed use space across the United States. Uh, and today, he's gonna, uh, going to give us his insight into Central Ohio uh, in, in the, through, for a development phase through 2050. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for welcoming me here. Uh, uh, the, the subject of my presentation today is uh, Inside 2050. Uh, but before I get into it, I would like to make a few comments. Some people ask me, including your president, where I was from. I said Chillicothe, Ohio. She went quiet because first she could not understand the word I said. But then she figured out what I was saying, and that was a moment of silence. I was born in Istanbul, in Turkey. That's the accent. I went to college in France, so I lived in France many years, served in the French Armed Forces, because they have an army, believe it or not. And then I came here, started uh, my own company about 20-some years ago, 23, 22 years ago, April 1st. And um, yes, I did Eastern in Columbus. We also did the Green in Dayton, for those of you who know. And we are building now Liberty in Cincinnati. We have done other projects in other states. Uh, today's subject is 2050. I have plenty of time. Normally, I mean, the, the presentation I'm going to make is about 20 minutes. Uh, and then I will take questions and answers. But feel free, knowing you know, my background, uh, that we can discuss Eastern. We can discuss the future of retail. We can discuss future of mixed use. We can discuss the impact of the omni-channel retailing on the on the brick and mortar businesses. You know, so I mean, it's going to be an open forum. That's just an excuse for you know me to start the conversation here. So uh, I hope everybody can hear me, right, with this microphone. Okay. So 2050. Um, Inside 2050 is a study. You know, we did, which we completed the first phase of which is really a cooperation of the three organizations on top of the page. Three organizations, that is MORPSI, which I will talk about, Urban Land Institute, and Columbus 2020 got together, did that study, 
in order to deal with the population growth and the future, future development patterns in our region. Well, first let me give you kind of the summary of this in about three sentences or maybe long sentences. Uh, the first thing is good news. In the next 30 years, we are going to add half a million people in this region. Half a million people, 300,000 jobs, and about 300,000 residential units. Uh, the state of Ohio during that same period is going to grow by about 400,000 people. So it is happening here. What's happening in Ohio is happening in central Ohio. We are the engine of the state, so that's the good news. So why all this? Well, it's good, we are growing. Well, I'm going to make a parallel about cars, and then you can understand then later in my presentation why I mean by this. So we are a car manufacturer. You are part of the manufacturers and dealers of cars. And we have been selling for the last 30 years. Our big sellers were the minivans. We are selling minivans like, you know, nonstop, making lots of money with it. And now someone is coming and telling you the next 30 years, we'll have to have another half a million people. So we are all, you know, rubbing our hands and we are saying, great. So I will build bigger dealerships, we'll build manufacturing facilities, we'll do more minivans and so forth until we realize, or we are talking about it now, that the 500,000 people that are coming, they don't want minivans, they want convertibles. So we have to be careful that we are geared up for the customer who is coming and not for the customer we had. So this is the story of this I'm going to tell you in terms of real estate, regional growth, and what we are doing. So we don't build minivan factories where the customers are going to want convertibles or pickup trucks. So that is a look into the future. So who are the three organizations? Uh, first, MORPSI. MORPSI is Middle Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Yeah, great, because we always call it MORPSI. So this is the region, they get together. It's a kind of a very political organization. It used to be a very boring organization, but very important because all the dollars, transportation dollars that build roads, comes through them and then get distributed in this area. So if you are in Ross County and you want some road widened somewhere, you are competing with Delaware County and Franklin County and there are freeways and two-lane roads and four-lane roads and this has to be allocated, so their board is made of every county commissioner and the mayor and the township trustees and, I mean, not every one of them, but I mean, every one of those are represented. So you can imagine that big machine, their job is basically deal with transportation systems and funding, then having regional data, because the way we are organizing in the United States, we organize in Ohio, the planning does not happen in a big regional planning place. There is like, in this jurisdiction, you see there might be 300 independent jurisdictions who do planning. So if you don't gather all that data on one single map, nobody has any idea what everybody else is doing. So their job is the blue thing that is organized the regional data into one cohesive document that people can go and look at and understand what's going on. Energy and air quality, they are in the impact because some forms of you know, things create more air quality problems than others. Planning an environment, I mean, obviously rivers and streams and pollution does not know the boundaries of the township and the street is, so you have to look at it globally, what happens. And then public government and government affairs, that is defending the interests of the central Ohio region with the state government and the federal government, so you get our fair share of what we need. So what that MORPSI does, the Columbus 2020, on the other hand, is about increasing the economic development of Ohio. 2020 was picked, frankly, I don't know, five years ago, 10 years ago, whenever it was created. It's an organization who regroups the major businesses of the, of the region, and their job is job creation. And for some reason, I don't remember the number, but their goal was that in 10 years, we are going to, by 2020, we are going to add 100,000 jobs or 200,000 jobs, we get a billion dollars invested. They had some very specific numerical goals because it's not a government agency, it's owned by private businesses, and the private businesses want, do not want some general conversation. They put them accountable to create that many jobs, to get that much investment in the region. And I don't know the numbers again because I'm not actively involved in it, but they are on their track and they might be even ahead of the curve of what they are trying to achieve. 
So their job is to get businesses to come to Ohio or people develop business in Ohio. That is, they work as well as encouraging venture capital as well as attracting people to come here. The third organization is Urban Land Institute. Uh, and this is, I am part of the Board of Governors and Alicia, our executive director is here. I don't get paid, she get paid. It's like Kathy here, you know, we have different things. And <laughs> but the uh, ULI, is the really the, I, I call it the nobility of real estate. They do not focus on one thing. ULI works on designing, you know, mountain resorts, tropical resorts, high rise buildings in downtowns, uh, creating uh, residential subdivisions uh, on apartments, hospitality, you know, I mean, adult living. I mean, they group anybody who uses land basically in the United States. And their membership is made of, I mean, the, the top people you know in the country, I mean, Gerald Hines, Trammell Crow, or people here, Casto, Frank Cass. I mean, all those people are members of that group, and it goes across all disciplines. And the goal is a little bit idealistic, is how can intelligent land use can improve quality of life? So like, I am in the retail business, so my association, equivalent to yours, is the ICSC, International Council of Shopping Center, transactional place, you know, we make deals and we learn, we teach each other and things like that. And then the next level on top would be the ULI in the sense that, you know, we become then a small portion of a much bigger thinking. If you are interested in land use as a mission, that's something that you, know, you think is important for you, your community and so forth, I strongly invite you to join ULI. Associate membership is not very expensive. Lots of events, lots of things happens all the time. The annual conferences are very enriching. But it's expensive. I mean, it's not a cheap organization to join. So Columbus, uh, uh, the district uh, ULI council in Columbus was created about, I don't know, eight years ago or something like that. We're one of the youngest organizations. Today I can tell you that ULI Columbus is a national model in fast growth and energy and, uh, and dynamism we have. And I don't say because it's us, but our colleagues in Cincinnati, in Cleveland, Indianapolis, I mean, and Detroit, we meet with them. We are clearly the most dynamic the district in the region, you know, going forward. And so we uh, initiated an effort called Columbus 2050, which was a document, how do we imagine Columbus's future? What do we want of Columbus? Again, that document is available online. You can look at it. It was, it was an interactive effort where we get the community leaders to get involved, the university to get involved, and they dream the kind of city they would like to live in which the same kind of things that you want, quality of life, jobs, diversity, environmental sustainability, I mean, all those things, and uh, which basically painted a picture of the future. But then what happened is we said, okay, so now we are dreaming about the future from an intelligent land use. We have the economic development people of Columbus 2020 and MORPSI. How did we get together and what did we do? So here's what's happening. We find out, because we hired a demographer from the University of Utah, from Salt Lake City, and we conducted a study about demographic growth in the region. You know, from you know, the way we are today, people scientifically can determine you know, the children we make, the immigration, the immigration, and you know, where we end up. We find out that there's going to be about 500,000 more people, 300,000 new jobs, 300,000 new residences. That already gives you a hint about the convertible idea and then one billion square feet of new redevelopment of non-residential building space. So, I mean, suddenly, I mean, frankly, we and everybody else woke up and we said, wait a minute, you know, we are kind of a sleepy Columbus and, you know, we feel that we are okay. We are more than okay. Things are going to happen here and we better start thinking like cities like Austin, you know, more dynamic environments because that's the future we are going to get here and what is going to happen to us, we need to be, you know, ready for it. And uh, so let's look at the numbers. This is my, uh, you know, please go ahead. That 500,000 growth, is that Morpsy map or? or Morpsy, Morpsy map, Morpsy. the central, I mean, oh. Morpsy map, but it's, you know, you take Franklin, it, it's more than the SMSA because the, the Morpsy map is bigger than the SMSA. The SMSA might be nine counties, this is 11 or 13 counties. Okay, she corrects me. It's seven county region is the 500,000. But what we are finding out though, when you go to Ross County, there might be 5,000 jobs. I mean, what I'm saying is it's really, I mean, closer to get to the middle, denser it gets, it's happening. So 
these are the good news. And the reason I kind of quipped about the 300,000 jobs, 300,000 residences, that's one for one, you know, or the population growth is 1.2. You know, average American household is 2.47. So that means that our household getting a bit smaller, the new households, than the ones we are used to see. So here's, let's look at the demographics. So this is 1980, 2010. So we look back 30 years and we look forward 30 years. So when you look back 30 years, where is the growth? The way you compare the growth, the, the dark color is 1980, and the lighter color is 2010. So the way you look at where the growth is, you look where the gray is comparable to the black. You know, so you can see that the area marked 35 to 54 year old families, children, etc. Basically, this is where the growth is. I mean, the black almost doubles up during that period, and everything are happening there. If you look, for example, at the smaller categories, the growth is less. But then fast forward, looking the next 30 years, huh, suddenly the, the period that was growing in the last 30 years, barely growing, you know, 45 year old, for example, you know, almost flat, right? I mean, there is no growth. I mean, it doesn't mean that people don't age, but it means that that category of age, that five year tranche, is the same number of people for the next 30 years. That doesn't grow. But where is the growth? You see some growth in the younger people, bigger than in the past, but a huge growth in older people. I mean, they double also in their numbers. So if you want, the black is what we need to furnish homes for, or jobs for, or places to live for. And if we organize our plan, like in the previous slide, that is, if we organize our plan to satisfy that group, we are building the wrong product. We are building the wrong product. Are we, what are we planning for? Because if we are all building you know, one acre subdivisions, one acre home subdivisions, and the need is uh, here, that's the wrong product we are building. So I mean, so the consequences of that are complicated because now, I mean, you are maybe at the tail end of this, but imagine the people who do the plans for the communities, the people who are investing in the road for the communities. What do you do? So we wanted to know what are the consequences of this. And at Urban Land Institute, at our governance committee, which meets at Lindy's once every three months, I mean, that's one of the <laughs> benefits of the job, you know, one day we had that conversation. So, I mean, how do we address this? How do we tell people what we need to do? What is the consequences of this? And, uh, and then we said, well, you know, there is a consultant we can hire and you can make an analysis and looking forward, project the consequences of this. Then we, we asked ourselves, well, if you looked at the 2050 model, you know, the ULI document I mentioned to you that we did in Columbus, dreaming about the future, that dream, frankly, was very impacted by the Gen X and Gen Ys because they are very active in those meetings. They came and talked and meet downtown and discussed it and planned it and so forth. So the dream was, you know, we want bicycle path. We want to live closer together. We want to be able to work to places. We want to be able to walk from work to home. I mean, it was that more traditional. I mean, I don't want to say it was the short north, but it was German village. I mean, that was kind of seemed to vibrate. We said, well, what if you do that study and the conclusion says we need to build more you know, New Albany, Delaware, Dublin's, Powell's. And we, among ourselves, I mean, at leadership of ULI, because we had to put money into this, we said, well, you know, whatever the consequence is, is the consequence. I mean, we have no preference. It will be what it will be. We are trying to diagnose what the issue is rather than trying to push one agenda versus another agenda. And that was a very liberating comment because we basically said it will be what it will be. So, and the reason why we are all involved is so those three organizations getting together was also a ULI initiative. I mean, we initiated that marriage of the three organizations because we knew that if Urban Land Institute was dreaming like the 2050, you know, this future of the city by ourselves, it would be a dream. So we said, we need to get the powers behind the throne. We need to get Columbus 2020 involved, the Wexner, the Wolves, the Cardinal Development. I mean, all the big guys in town who are thinking about the future of the economy, let's get them involved in this conversation so let's see what the consequences are and how it impacts. But then we need to go after MORPSI. The problem was because MORPSI has access to the federal dollars. We don't have. Those studies cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. The first one was almost half a million. And uh, so we need their help. And MORPSI loved the idea of getting involved with the community in a less bureaucratic level, less administrative level, but actually thinking about the future in a way. 
And also they loved us because we had to find a matching fund. So we, ULI, raised about $100,000 or whatever we need to do so that we can activate the 400000 of the Fed's money and then we'll come all together and work on this. So when we look at the, so we talk population. So now let's talk about household types. Again, a bit of statistics. Look at the first column and the three lines. The top is the singles living alone. The next one are households without children. And the bottom one are households with children. Okay, so these are the three categories. In 2010, 31% the traditional household, 41% household but no kids, and then 28% singles living alone. Then jump to the right, forget the middle for a minute. And then you see 28%. I mean, I can use the pointer, I think, right? Yeah, 28%, 38%, and 34%. If you look at this, say, okay, big deal. I mean, they were 41% of household without children. Now we have 38. And then we had 31 is 28, and 28 became 34. Okay, there's a bigger increase there, but I mean, it's not a big deal. I mean, okay, there's some percentage move. But look at the middle. The middle is what we need to deliver in the next 30 years. And then when you look at this, you say, oh my God, look at this. So 55% of the new product has to be delivered to households without children, I mean to single households. These are young guys after school, guys, girls, I mean people, you know, after uh, start to work life, not married yet, or retired people who just lived alone, either separated or because, etc. I mean, what the matter? So suddenly, we are seeing at the product we need to provide. So if you plan the past, that is, if you keep building you know, uh, if we keep building, uh, you know, minivans, whatever it was, you know, 28% of convertibles, 41% of minivans, we need to switch to 55% of convertibles and 31% of minivans. And that has huge consequences. I mean, if you are a, a residential broker and you are selling homes, well, I will sell whatever comes to me because you are at the end of food chain, but the builder who is buying land to plan for the future or inventorying land, or the cities, villages who are planning the future use of land in their communities, and Morpsey who is allocating dollars and freeways and sewer systems and you know, sewer plants and so forth, all this has consequences. So if we go this direction, and we should have been going that way, lots of money gets wasted for things that are not either useful or placed the wrong way. So then, Qualitative questions, you make surveys, and we have to listen to Gen X and Gen Y. Gen X in particular, I mean, are clearly the generation who is going to be driving the boat. The baby boomers, my generation, we were the past one. The next one is not the X, it's the Y. That generation is as big as us, bigger than us, very different, different needs and different things. What do they want? I mean, that's not for Gen Y. This is a general survey. People who are more walkable neighborhoods, more mixed-use environments, they want communities who are mixed age, mixed income communities. And I'm going to use New Albany as an example where I live. <coughs> we are waking up in New Albany too. Because up to now, you know, we are very proud of our Powell like thinking. You know, one acre per home, you know, average and big green land. You know, we don't want apartments, we don't want this, we don't want that. Well, if you do that, we are going to be catered only to that middle category of people with children. My son graduated Notre Dame, you know, software guy. He doesn't want to live in New Albany. I mean, if he comes to Columbus, it's going to be short north, and then he end up moving to Madison or Ann Arbor. Or, I mean, you can imagine the kind of cities this generation likes. So I lost him, and New Albany lost him, because they told me, Dad, where would I live in New Albany? I mean, look at all the guys from Abercrombie and Fitch. They commit all the way to downtown, you know, across New Albany, although New Albany is five minutes from there, because it's not a mixed-use environment. Reverse, some of us are my age. You know, we are getting at the end of our lives. You know, do you want to pay 25000 in property taxes, you know, in an empty house? You know, where do I go? In New Albany, there's nothing for me. So on the other hand, you know, around OSU, going to class in the evenings, going to concerts sounds exciting, you know? An apartment on top of North Star. My wife doesn't cook anymore. That's what gets when you get older. You know, so, you know, I mean, then options, you know, under the house. In New Albany, and I, I get in my car and go and get the food. So people want more <laughs> mixed use. <laughs> Don't say anything to Pat. More mixed age, mixed income communities. That's everybody lives together. These communities are lifelong communities. You are born there, you go to school there, you get your first job there, you raise children there, you age there, you die there. This is the ideal community. And smaller residences, people are willing to accept smaller residences in, in exchange for the convenience. 
I mean, this is not about getting one acre north of Delaware, you know, in a thousand square foot home. I mean, people are saying, look, I'll go smaller if I can do other things, you know, cheaper and more transportation choices. I mean, you also know the big difference, right? Gen Ys, cars. I mean, you are hearing the rumors, right? I mean, kids get 16. They don't care about driver licenses. They get 17, still not, you know, maybe 18. If you say them get a car, it's a car, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, owning a car is not a big deal because they are users, not owners. They don't care about ownership. They care about the use of things. For them, Uber is perfect. You know, I mean, he calculates, you know, how much is going to car cost me per month? How many times do I use Uber? And whatever is cheaper, that's what I do. Personal example, I have a Chris Craft sitting at Buckeye Lake, which cannot float anymore, you know why. <laughs> so my son is in Madison. I said, perfect, so why don't I ship it to you? Just take it there, because it takes us five years of dredging the place or building the dam, so I cannot use the boat. You have it. You can use it there and so forth. He asked me, I mean, first job, right? So he said, how much is that going to cost me? I said, I don't know, 150, 200 a month. You know, I mean, you need to put gas, you need to store it somewhere, etc." He said, Dad, he said, I can rent a boat for $200 Saturday afternoons. I don't think I'll use it more than 10 times a year. So, I mean, keep the boat. <laughs> so, basically, he's a user, right? He doesn't, I mean, the fact that he owns a Chris Craft doesn't make anything for him. He basically wants to know. I mean, if I use it, I'll have it. Cars, same thing. It's a tool. That's a very changing generation as we are going forward. So, the housing consequences of that are that here are the housing preferences. The 21% the going up and going down is the conventional home, right? The garage, the kids, the backyard, and so forth. And you can see, I mean, the attached or smaller lot homes. A smaller lot is over seven homes an acre, I think, is the definition we use. So smaller home, I mean, doesn't mean a micro home. It's still decent, but, I mean, a German village density or sizes kind of environment, or Italian village or things like that. So job consequences also. Uh, there are commercial consequences. I mean, job consequences, I mean, you know, this is the environments they like. You know, that's what we are looking for. You know, we are not looking for the big shopping center. Commercial consequences, you know, you see that is working, this is not working anymore. You know, and uh, infrastructure issues, you know, what do you build, where do you build, how do you do things, and so forth. I mean, here's a little slide presentation, because in Columbus, one of the things MORPC is doing, working together, we are making an inventory of all the potential infill. There's a billion square foot of real estate, commercial real estate, that will be recycled in the next 30 years into more dense environments. So that's typical stage. is going to become like this. It's going to get to be nicer on the street. Then it's going to have some building on the curb. Then it's going to be an R building on the other side. Then it's going to have an R building on the other side. And that is basically in full redevelopment, taking places and making them more complete and more attractive to people. He is, Peter, is a internationally well-known uh, architect, urban planner, based in Berkeley. Uh, I, I always joke about the Berkeley part because that's like Communist Republic of Berkeley. But the, so the question is, as he says, uh, you know, you know where you are. The question is, where are you going? I mean, you can read the sentence there. So what is, you know, what do we do? So these studies help us decide where we go. So, so we made four scenarios. We did not tell him, you know, what you do in, in New Albany or what you do in Delaware or what you do downtown. So the first scenario is, what we do the last 30 years, we repeat exactly the same thing going forward. That was scenario A. Scenario B, we said, well, instead of being stupid about it, let's see what kind of plans our community has. Go to New Albany. What is your plan for the next 30 years? Go to Delaware, go to Grove City, go to Pickerington, go to Lancaster, go to etc., and see what is their plan for the future. Well, you will see their plan is a little bit more intelligent than repeating the last 30 years. I mean, clearly the market is already adjusting to this perceived change. Scenario C is, you know, focus on all the empty land we have. You know, why don't we just use what we have instead of going and buying, you know, building more green outside? And then scenario D is a real proactive regional where we try to compact everything as much as we can. Scenario D, not very realistic because we do not have the power, the political system that allows that 13 state, uh, I mean, county area to be work in unison. Everything is voluntary here. And that's the beauty of the effort we have done. We give the information, then you decide what you want to do. But so we cannot really compact regionally. So every, every city, every community, every township have to think on their own. So, and we studied those eight variables. Now, 
you have sheets uh, which summarize all of them. I will only cover four here. And, uh, and also, if you are interested in this, go online, uh, inside2050.org, I think it is, right? Get inside2050.org. I mean, the, the full report is there. It's really good reading, but I mean, it, you have to be interested in the subject. I mean, because I mean, the statistics are very clear. I mean, it's understandable. It's not, there's color photographs. I mean, it's well illustrated. It's not kind of a legal document. It's very helpful. So we look at those, uh, you know, eight uh, characteristics. And I can tell you already, I mean, the scenario A, B, C, D, it gets more and more efficient in almost every measurement you can have. I mean, you can say, for example, public health cost. How can you talk about public health costs? I mean, what this has to do with land use? Well, there's an absolute direct correlation between particulates in the air and lung problems and asthma and all the upper respiratory illnesses. I mean, established medically. So more gas you burn, more things you put in the air, then more illness you are going to have. You know what I mean? And all those things tied together, and it's interesting that land use has an impact in all those areas. So land consumption. Uh, today, to give you a sense, I think the city of Columbus or the region is about 225 square miles. You know, we have one of the big cities in the country. I mean, as a boundary of a city. We are, I mean, we are a large city. We have 225 square miles. This is, if we continue the growth of the, you understand, the region is bigger than the city of Columbus, obviously. But, so if you go forward with the past trends, which I don't think is going to happen, we will need another 495 square miles of land. To kind of put it in perspective, that 25 miles by 20 miles square, I mean, of things to build more things going outward. But if you look at the plans we have, which is good, we need 270 square miles of land. That is 270 square miles of you know, farmland, green land, whatever you want to do, we have to take and to build our communities in it, which is still more than the city of Columbus proper. So in the next 30 years, we'll add another city of Columbus you know, to the region and even more than that. I mean, so I don't know which way it will go because we are not getting into where it goes. We are saying that's what it will take. But if we are a little bit intelligent about it and we start thinking, let's turn in terms of infill, fill the blanks we have, we only need 45 square miles. I mean, that's huge. I mean, you can save 225 miles, square miles of farmland or green space. That's the circle you can see on top of the, the middle one here. You know, all this can be saved, which is the equivalent of city of Columbus. And then maximum infill is that uh, even more driven, where you can only take 15 square miles and so forth. Then you look at the capital expenditure, we look at the fiscal impacts. That is, that is the taxes the governments have to collect from their citizens. You know, look at the different scenarios. And I mean, you can see the difference between capital and operating costs, operations and maintenance. And I mean, you can see how it goes down. And these are billions, right? I mean, you can see, for example, that that scenario here, the middle scenario, I mean, shows a, you know, a saving. I mean, that is not very clear on the slide. So you go from this to this, you save $2.6 billion of taxes. This is money in our pockets, you know, if the, the, we don't spend it on doing this. Uh, uh, then this is like number of billion vehicle miles that will be traveled. I mean, if you go from scenario B and C, you know, you can see that, uh, I mean, you can save 3.4 billion vehicle miles less traveled you know, for every new resident. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, that's the not residence, the next one, I think. No, well, hold on. Okay, these slides don't have all the slides I have, but so, so inside 2050 was all this information coming and resulting in conclusions of what we need to do. The report looks like this. We gave you, I think, the summary page here, but I mean, and you know, you see they are nicely presented. The report itself, I mean, it's really well done. I mean, it's worth reading. Uh, I mean, you might have some uh, influence in your communities or where you go with this. And, uh, and so uh, I, I, I think that's online, right? This is getinside2050.com. And you can see, you click, you can read the report, you can go to the growth and you know, all those different things. And uh, so basically, what we are saying is to the community is, look, you know, we are the engine of the state. We are going to be the engine of the state. This is huge for us, because forget about the population growth. When I talk about those things, because I'm developing in Cincinnati right now, say in Butler County, it, they don't understand. I mean, we are not talking the same language. In this community, because of this effort, there has been an incredible wake-up call 
That is, everybody is waking up now. Suddenly, I get phone call from Grove City telling me, well, we have that racetrack, you know, I mean, what should be the best way to do this? Well, before you have given it to someone to do some subdivision, what is the best thing? You know, city of Newark, I mean, you know, we have this beautiful town square with the courthouse, you know. I mean, do you think we should put lofts in it to attract the, our kids so they stay? I mean, conversations that never happened before, Lancaster, you know, I mean, uh, you know, New Albany suddenly saying, wait a minute, maybe we need to create some high density stuff around the village center. You know, you have heard about Dublin, about their uh, bridge uh, view corridor, you know, because now they are saying, huh, you know, because I mean, we can, we can have all those houses, but suddenly when IBM wants to put an office and asking where the workers, their workers are not there, they're in the short north. You know, in General Electric, I mean, moved their whole research offices downtown Cincinnati on the banks because the people working from them wanted to live you know, within bicycle or walking distance. They didn't want to be out in the, you know, where the land is cheap for building office buildings. So all this is changing right now. So I think because of this, we are ahead of the curve. We are thinking about the future and we are trying to take advantage of it. That was phase one. Now I, we are about to enter into phase two and it'll be phase three. The phase two, I'm not gonna remember now what I just said the other day, but uh, we are starting phase two. It's a year long effort also where we are doing a few things. We are first organizing the communities of the Central Ohio in groups. We are saying every county seat has the same problems. Say, in New Albany and Lancaster don't think along, uh, don't, don't think the same way. New Albany and Dublin might think the same way, but Lancaster and Newark are thinking the same way, and Grove City and uh, Pickerington might be thinking the same way. So we are trying to organize them in similar groups and then for each category, we'd like to initiate a planning effort for them where they apply those lessons. How does that work in my own community? So if you do it for Lancaster, we'll invite the people from Athens, the people from you know, other county seats to come and participate to the effort so they can, because we don't have the resources to do that you know, 13 times, but we can do it a few times. And then later what we'll do, we'll have also a, uh, a tool then they will be able to download and model their own community themselves. Uh, so it's playing SimCity a little bit, you know, if you know that game, maybe we are too old for this. But anyway, it's kind of building your own community and creating your own uh, economics and see how that works. We are creating an inventory also, you know, MORPC and working with everyone, of all the inflow opportunities in the region, the billion square feet I'm talking about. So let's know where they are, where the land is, what can be done and things like that. What else? Uh, Yeah, I mean, obviously we are doing what we are doing to you. And, you know, I mean, we are volunteering right now. I mean, you know, I'm doing that obviously as a volunteer, but we, all of us, I mean, MORPC is professional staff. Uh, I mean, city managers, volunteers, steering committee, we go and talk. I mean, we speak at uh, formal meetings, at commission meetings. We speak in the evenings or professional meetings like this. I mean, I even jokingly say, we'll even meet Saturday afternoon, evening in a bar and, you know, talk to a group of people. I mean, we are trying to spread the gospel and what's happening is for all of us in the commercial development business, it's real interesting that suddenly there is a connection between land use and economic development. Before those things, you know, economic development, how much money can I make on my 10 acre piece of land I own? Now we start thinking, well, what I do has an impact and the powers to be are looking to land use as an issue to, to be dealt with. So suddenly the efforts that are happening downtown Columbus, you know, I mean, the beautification efforts, the investments and so forth are becoming critical. The, the transportation issues are becoming critical because if you want to create density, you need to have a better transportation network. So, I mean, all those things are coming together now. So it's not anymore, frankly, I don't know what the outcome will, will be, but five years ago when Mayor Coleman said, I'm gonna build a tram line, it was like our Columbus 2050, uh, it was an intellectual, it was coming from the heart almost, like there is no total rational explanation why, but you know, that, wouldn't that be good? Or things like, you know, every big city in the world, I mean, has, you know, public transportation, and, but there were, now we're looking at it differently. If we can show that density saves money, I mean, taxpayer improve the health and saves less energy, I mean, you can go through the whole metrics, well, then how do you create density? Then if you coordinate the public transportation with increased zoning densities that you cannot get a public transportation network and then go to nine months worth of hearing to add a floor to a building, that doesn't work. I mean, everything has to be done at the same time. But so this is the thing that allows us to do. So that was kind of the, the presentation. Uh, I mean, you can, that's Kirsten, the Morpsey's uh, 
president or no, executive director, I don't know what her title is, but anyway, she's the woman behind the, the throne. And in our case, uh, you know, we have Alicia here for ULI, and uh, if you want to join ULI, contact Alicia before we are done. And I need to find $140,000 of private funds, the matching funds for the second phase of this thing. Anybody wants to make a donation, I'll take it. That was the presentation. No, sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, I mean, maybe you need to explain that better than me. But I mean, the land consumption was an important element. You know, that amount of land we are not using for Columbus uh, 2020 economic development, because one of the strengths of our region is the agro business. So we did not want to lose 270 square miles of, you know, I mean, maybe not all of it was farmland, but I mean, two thirds of it would have been given the future of the region and where we are trying to, to, base our, to base our growth. Because now the thinking is, what is the value added crops that we can create here more than doing just corn? You know, I mean, should the region get into more into the wine business? Should the region get into more organic food business? I mean, because we have the inherent basic talents, but after the crisis of, and I'm not a farmer, so I won't know exactly, of 1980s, from a very diverse crop region, we went to a single crop region, I mean, or simple stuff, you know, and big fields and so forth. And to make money, to get, we need now to complex the thing again, to make it more complicated. That is, we need to get into organic, we need to get into value added, I mean, maybe wine production, and we need to get in that, those kind of businesses. Or if you get in the egg business, we need to get a humane way where the waste is then recycled and things like that. And that's a very big engine. I mean, we have lots of investment coming to Europe right now to the region, you know, for uh, agricultural investment. And so we have to make sure that we, pre I'm so it's kind of counterintuitive. Now you don't want to use land so that you preserve another engine of the economy. I mean, th these are all the aspects of this who, I mean, we, we, everybody wakes up to different things. One thing I learned also, maybe I should say Columbus 2020, up to this process, first I will tell you myself, I mean, I did Eastern and all that stuff living here now over 15 years. I had no clue that we are going to have a million people, that we are the engine of the state. You know, until about four or five years ago, you know, we're still kind of not too proud of ourselves. I don't know what's happening. In the last few years, we are taking, become aware suddenly of who we are and what we can do and what we are. And I mean, all these efforts are waking us up and they're very, very important for us. But what we are finding out, the economic development, that also something I thought that, you know, economic development was about going to, I don't know, Honda and do a plant here and build things or get a software company, give them huge tax breaks and attract them here, free land and everything else. Now Columbus 2020 is explaining to me that doesn't work that way anymore. Today, getting a business here is not a problem if you have the labor force. The first now is the labor force. That is, do you have the software engineer or the medical researchers or the personnel who is here, which will then staff the jobs you are trying to create? That's the first thing they look at. So if our city is empty, of the young people, of the educated people, of the people who are the, the next generation workforce, the inventors, the, the creators, etc., and then you cannot attract the business. Then it's our job again. So how do you get those people to be here? Well, you have to, to make, to create a sexy German village, a sexy short north, a sexy, I mean, all those things we are talking about, Dublin downtown and New Albany, I mean, we need to create places that these people want to live and raise their children in if you can do those things, then we'll attract the businesses. So suddenly, land use, who has the tail wagging the dog, becomes almost one of the most important things in a way we invent the Columbus of future, our neighborhoods, how we live and what we do, if we are to be prosperous and be able to attract businesses here. I think I'm going to stop now. I took way more than the 20 minutes allocated, but since I had time, I took advantage of it. So you can ask me questions, go in the back.
Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going to be able to answer the question in detail, but, but first, I don't know. But, the, but the, the single households are a combination of young households and old households. I mean, right now, they are lumped together. You are right. From a residential use standpoint, I mean, you know, a single household, a young single household, say 30-year-old and less, does not have the same needs as a 60-year-old empty household. I mean, they are different. So, but in the study, which we have access also to, I mean, we can talk to ULI and we give you access to the demographic study, the pure demographic analysis done by University of Utah, then goes into the different you know, category of those things. But the way we are looking at it right now, because I mean, we, have to, we are looking at it at a much higher level, what we are thinking is, well, we need to handle the single households. One thing we know, they don't want a four-bedroom house with three-car garage. You know, so then what happens then in that category? I mean, some of them might be nursing homes, or the adult assisted living facilities. I mean, it's a whole range of things. I mean, I, I mean, if you want, from a land use standpoint, both consume much less land than the other one. So for our model, that's what we care about. But if you're a home developer or a home builder, I mean, clearly you need to get into the numbers and figure out which is which. I mean, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I, I don't know enough. But I mean, that data is available now. The, Demographic study is much more boring reading than the 20, inside 2050. But, but there is details. I mean, there is details. They, they justify. There's an immigration. We are going to become more mixed. I mean, more uh, Latin population, more immigrant population. I mean, the whole thing is changing. I mean, I don't remember in Columbus the non-Hispanic whites become a minority over the 30 years. Probably not quite. But I mean, I mean the changes you see in America are happening, will happen in Columbus too. Okay, she tells me that it's available to get inside 2050 then. In, in that, you have a link or something to the demographic study. Yeah. You must have some questions. So, um, with the development of the growth rate, do you see or do you foresee um, development to the white or the high rise Do I see high-rise living in outside places than New Albany, than downtown New Albany or other places? Uh, what's going to happen is, and Columbus is well placed for this, we are going to become a mosaic of villages. You know, we are going to have, I mean, they are the obvious ones. You know, you have the Bexley and the Upper Arlingtons and the New Albanies and the Grove Cities and the Gahanas and so forth. But then also you have the city of Columbus neighborhoods, the Northeast neighborhood, and they have names, all those neighborhoods. All those neighborhoods or existing municipalities somehow are going to seek to have a center. You know, they are going to want an identifiable center. I like to take a good example. For example, Northeast Columbus neighborhood, which is where Easton is located, that whole neighborhood goes down all the way to the airport and you know, on the fringes of Cleveland Avenue. If I ask you, what's the center of that neighborhood? Forget Columbus. Columbus is a regional center. Where's that center of that neighborhood? Where is the kind of where the community gets together? You cannot give me a place. I mean, even Gahana. I mean, there were some attempts, you know, to do things here and there. But what's the center of Gahana? You know, so what happens is, to answer your question, every community is going to say, okay, so where is my center? Where is my place, my pedestrian-friendly place, whether it's Grove City or Pickering or Ellsberg? And then those areas, are going to be denser for those who want that kind of experience. And then within those environments, things are going to get also higher. But higher, that doesn't mean, like downtown Lancaster, you might see four or five story buildings. You know, but I mean, now in Easton, I think we'll see in the next five years, probably 10, 12 story residences. You know, but, but that's Easton. You know, I don't know what's going to happen in Dublin. That might not happen in Ghana. But, what you're going to do, every village, like you think of them as a village, will have its little center with its coffee shop and the dry cleaner and the pharmacy where some people are going to want to live above the stores so they can go down, not use a car, and live there and enjoy that. And then as it goes out, it will become attached homes. Then it will become you know, single family homes as you get further away. And, and then ideally, the center cores of every neighborhood, tall or not, will then be connected to the immediate neighborhood to the area through bicycle paths and otherwise. And if you came to a speech made recently, the bicycle paths, uh, we are going to entirely rethink the business of bicycle. Uh, today, uh, they are hardcore bicyclists, you know, 2%, who will drive snow, rain, whatever it is, they are all the gear and everything else. 
There's another 6-7%, if you give them some bicycle paths, they might take it. But there's another 40-50%, you know, statistically, who will not drive bicycles, they feel threatened. I mean, so you need to create bicycle paths who are safe. And we, Eastern, right now, we are about to fund internally a whole network studying how do you connect Gahana, New Albany, Westerville, and Northland to Eastern through safe bicycle paths that any one of you would consider taking. Not that we are going to build all this, because that would be you know, tens of millions of dollars, but at least we are going to go into conceptual design of this. That is, what would it take for me to let a 15-year-old kid or 12-year-old kid of mine to get on his or her bicycle in New Albany and bicycle to Easton? What would it take? And that's what we need to provide. So that's what's going to happen. So not only will we create these villages with their centers, but then we'll connect things to it from the area. You know, we, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know the exact information, but I can tell you. We made that presentation to the Home Builder Association, to the developers. We are talking to everyone. And what happens is, uh, I mean, they then they say, okay, but give me the land where I can do that. Your zoning doesn't allow me to do it. I mean, I, I, I understand. I hear what you say, but if you don't give me the lot sizes and the dimensions, so then that puts the pressure then on the village. I mean, for New Albany to even tolerate what you are talking about, that was already an effort on the part of MI to get that done. And, and also, some of that effort is you don't want to get ahead of things. I mean, if the fact that home builders are informed, trust me, about this is happening, they look at everything a little bit differently. Now we are on alert. You know, we are watching. And, you know, at least we're not going to do crazy things. You know, we'll be more prudent about it. But, I mean, your, I mean, your example is, a, you know, it's an education effort. Look, I'm not, I'm not a mayor. I'm not nothing. We are just volunteers. And, you know, if after this meeting some of you, you know, help, you know, spread the, this thinking so that people become more aware, that's, what, that's all we can do. Well, uh, go, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead and then, and then you. Okay. I mean, can you have multiple cores? Well, it depends. Uh, like, for example, you know, the region can only have one downtown. Right? I mean, I'm talking about a bigger scale. She's asking the question about Gahana, but let me talk about regional first. You, know, you don't want to duplicate downtown with everything downtown has, you know, with the, the, the children's museum, the art museum, and the ballpark, and the multiple theaters. I mean, you cannot go even at Easton, which would be maybe the second runner-up, to say, we are going to everything there, too. Downtown has one role to play. But in all of Columbus, can you have other downtowns or in the region? Yeah. Eastern clearly then becomes one of those run-wrap environments. Probably Dublin, that area, can become that too. And something in the south would be right. So extrapolate that to Gahana. Gahana has a historic center, which is by the Creekside area. And there, I mean, what killed them was the small thinking. They, they th actually, some people think they thought too big. In fact, they thought too small. But so that's a natural area where that could have become. But then Gahana is spreading all the way to other places. So you might consider that in Gahana, through efforts, maybe a second location can be created. Like in some cities, you have two high schools, you know, instead of only one high school, which is the New Albany choice. So there's nothing you know, forbidden about it. But our cities have forgotten the art of planning. You see, that's the, the problem. You know, I mean, we, I mean, I can make a whole presentation on urban planning issues and why we are doing what we are doing and the zoning rules and things like that. And we, I would be happy to do it because I'm just a subject dear to my heart. The problem is we forgot to plan. When Washington was created, what did we do? We hired Pierre L'Enfant, you know, who is the, the French planner. Chicago, the city beautiful movement, Olmsted. These people took the city, drew lines, established things, created axes, defined the city. In Gahana, tell me, who is doing that? You know. I mean, forget the famous names, but I mean, there's not even a planning function. The planning function has become a zoning function today. And zoning, I mean, zoning is a set, I mean, I can speak just half an hour on this. Zoning is a separation of uses. Zoning is something new that was invented in Euclid, Ohio. 
That's why we call it the Euclidean zoning, and not because of the Greek mathematician, but because of the city of Euclid. So what happened is 1926, the city of Euclid, for the first time in America, decided that to plan a city, they are going to create districts, you know, commercial district, industrial district, residential district. Real estate company, Ambler Realty, one of my colleagues 90 years ago, sued the city, saying that was taking under the, Amer the Constitution, the Fifth Amendment. Basically, you are reducing the value of my property. You give to me compensation if you're going to zone my land. It went to the Supreme Court, and they lost. That was the, you remember, the, the, the good for the community, more important than personal rights. I mean, Russian Revolution. I mean, that was the socialist period in the history. So the Supreme Court said, no way. That's good for the community, so you're not going to do it. Zoning started. We had the Depression. We had the Second World War the Scott market crash. So from that decision to 1945, there was nothing being built in America. So whether you have zoning or no zoning, nothing was happening anyway. So we forgot. We forgot planning. We forgot everything. 46, we came back from war. Now we needed houses. And we needed hospitals. And we needed offices. And we needed everything. Do you think that the city of Long Island had the time to hire Pierre L'Enfant, take a three year to design the no, zoning, perfect tool, dividing squares, residential developer, I give you the land, office developer, I give you the land. So we all start building our specialized product. If you're a residential developer, you know the residential lender, the residential brokers, the residential contractors, and that's all you do. If you're an office worker, you know what you are doing. So we did that. So for 30, 40 years, 1945 forward, you know, we built a zoned America, which was our urban planning tool, that is this square designed by engineers. So you say, what happened to our downtowns? America added 100 million people between 45 and 1980. 100 million people, so 200 went to 300 million. We did not create a single downtown. Not only we didn't create one, we destroyed the ones we had. Why? Because in zoning, it's very difficult to create a downtown. Because either you are residential or you are you know, office or you are thing. You cannot put them on top of each other. That's against the zoning. When I first went to do my project in Kansas City, mixed use project like Easton, you know, I go to the guy, the guy says, we are very progressive here. On that zoning, you can mix uses. I said, great. So I come with my drawing showing the retail apartments on top. He says, oh, they have to be 100 foot separation between the uses. So I said, OK. So I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, their sense of mixed use was very different. So my, my point is, is that we destroyed that art of, so now we are finally realizing there are projects like Easton and other projects where single-handedly against all the rules and all the principles and all the banks, we try to create those mixed-use environments in the last 15, 20 years. And things are changing for the good. Because now people are realizing there is merit in the short north. There is merit in German village. I mean, there is merit in mixed-use environments. And, and because at Morpsey level, I mean, they cannot plan the region. They cannot. They're not allowed by law by anybody else. Everybody is very jealous. Gahana, I plan Gahana. New Albany, I plan New Albany. I don't care if you are next to each other. We each do our own thing. So now, this makes people think, oh, well, in order to be successful, so I have the old people and the young people and everybody else, maybe we need to start planning. So how do you go about this? So we offer it for free. We fund it through private donations, federal monies, and so forth. So we hope that when they take the taste of it, then people say, wait a minute, maybe we can predict, we can plan our future instead of just living it, you know, and letting, you know, engineers tell us how our cities should be designed. So I hope that as planning function reintegrate our lives, then people will ask those questions to themselves. You know, in Gahana, do we need one village center, two village centers? You know, how far is far? You know, how far can people bicycle? You know, or is the Hamilton Road separate Gahana really in two? There should be one on one side, one on the other. I mean, these are the conversations we are going to have. It took us about 50 years to destroy America from an urban standpoint. I mean, 1945 to about 1990s. You know what? It's like everything in life. You know, you gain weight, you lose. It takes as long to lose it as it took to put it on. And the same thing. We messed up America. It will take as long. I mean, the target is 2045, I think, where we're going to see the result of all those efforts of this change. And frankly, our efforts, I mean, we are moving in the right direction. Things are good right now. But you, me, we are all working for our children, our grandchildren. I mean, in urban planning, I mean, you don't expect tomorrow that your neighbors will be fixed. You just become aware of those issues. And I think we are on the right path. I mean, there are many countries around the world who are where we were in 1990, and they are making the same mistakes. And our ULI group, we are preaching also around the world to try to tell them, don't go all the way there. Just stop now, and let us tell you the mistakes we made so that you don't do them. I'm sorry, it's a long answer to a short question. Yeah, 
I mean, you know, again, I can make a 45 minute presentation on that alone. Uh, you are right. There's a, there's a couple of things. Omnichannel retailing is the future now. Omnichannel, omni from Latin, that is multiple, multiple channel retailing. So today, a retailer comes to you basically, one of the most important retail stores now becomes this, right? I mean, I can buy anything right now. I mean, I can buy a car in five minutes, uh, you know, if I had to. So uh, only that every retailer now has to come to you through online, through brick and mortar, and many different ways. So the question you are asking first is, you know, what is the role of brick and mortar in this panoply of offering? You know, I mean, does it have room? I and mean, is it possible that in the future we might not need any brick and mortar at all? You know, is it possible? You know, obviously the first reaction is like you shake your head now, it's not, but you have to be careful that you don't do wishful thinking because you are in that business and, yeah, no, come on, you know, what do you mean it will never replace the touch and feel and this and that? Well, we believe, uh, UL, uh, uh, International Council of Shopping Centers uh, believes that uh, brick and mortar obviously will have a role to play, but it has to play into its strengths. And the strength of brick and mortar is going to be to deliver multi sensorial experiences. I mean, I'm summarizing it in, a, in one quick thing. So if retail experience is going to Costco and get something for cheaper, now this is a functional purchase. That is, it could be a warehouse. You are going for value. You are going to want it to be clean. You want to be well organized. You want to be nice. So if you are playing in that world, you have to compete in efficiency with the delivery system of Amazon or any other online retailer. But if you play the Eastern game, multi-sensorial experience, that you come to Eastern, it's an experience, you can spend an afternoon at Eastern, even without buying anything, if you had to. So we believe in, in the future now, the experience have to become the multi-sensorial experiences, activity centers, and very centered in experiential transactions. Like at Eastern today, the two department stores do about 150 million in sales. Our collection of restaurants do about 150 million dollars in sales. You know, and you can see that the, the restaurant collection of Easton is very critical to Easton's success because, and we only have celebratory food, I mean, mostly, very little functional food. So that means that most of the eating experiences at Easton is tied to an experiential, pleasant, emotional experience. Either it's your first date when you are 15, it's an anniversary dinner, drinking beer with friends. I mean, our collection of restaurants at people at different age groups and sex and income levels play to that celebratory role so you have an emotional attachment to the experience. So we believe that the brick and mortar going forward will have to become either very experiential or very efficient. Uh, like that is either they have to be German designed Costco's or they have to be Italian French designed, you know, Easton's. You know, I mean, that's where anything in between you have to decide either you are this or you're going to be that. Now, some people try to mix that, like a grocery store does that. If you get in a grocery store today, you say a good Kroger, you enter, to turn right, which is the instinctive turn. So try it. That's the marketplace. Fruits and cheeses and the wine and the sushi and all the experience, like a marketplace. You go to the left. Now you are in the rows of hard goods. You know, you just buy, put in your cart, and you go. So they try to play both roles. The functional role is on the left side, and then the emotional role, the experiential environment, is the marketplace on the right side. I mean, well, right, left, ignore that. But I mean, all the shopping centers, all the stores you know, think of them. They have two things. They have German distribution, effective aisle dimensions, height of the things, all designed to facilitate your shopping or send you the goods. And the other side is, you know, try the wine, you know, try the cheese, uh, do this, do that, which is the other one. But in shopping centers, difficult to do both at the same time. So you need to do one or the other. You cannot see, for example, in Easton with Costco or, or even um, Sam's Club, even worse, I mean, replacing Nordstrom, for example. I mean, we cannot do that. Uh, totally different businesses. Okay, I think I'm going to stop because we're past the time now. Thank you very much.